Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to today's session of Spiritual Saturday Book Club. So before we begin, I'll just do a little recap of what we've covered in the past sessions. What we've been covering is a book by Rinpoche called Gurus for Higher Enlightenment for Sale. And it is a book that is split into three parts. The first part is um, to do with the Guru. The second part is to do with the center and the third part is to do with ourselves on our spiritual transformation. So before we begin, let me just do the regular thing and see who is online and has joined us today. So over the last couple of sessions, what we've been covering is we've been covering the section on the Guru and how we should view a Guru, how we should um, act towards our Guru and um, how we should think about a Guru-Disciple relationship and that is something that we're going to continue on with in today's session. So I have seen some people join. Okay, so uh, good morning Iman, good to see you again. Uh, Sukhvan is also online, Pastor Hani, good morning, thank you for joining today's session. And um, that's as far as I, that's, as, that's all I can see for to, on at the moment. Okay, so um, today is uh, session six part six of the book and today I'm going to be covering what are known as the nine attitudes of Guru devotion. Um, while I wait for more people to join to see if anybody else does join today's session, uh, let me explain a little bit more uh, about the book. So this book, uh, which is based on a teaching that Rinpoche gave, um, is all about Dharma practice, Dharma the Dharma Center, our attitudes when we're in the Dharma Center, how we should think and get rid of certain conceptions that we have about what a Dharma Center should be like and um, how that actually helps us to further our knowledge and our practice towards enlightenment. And it's also about the Guru, which we've been discussing in detail. And at the end, the last section is about the ourselves, about how we should practice and how we should progress on the path to enlightenment. So as I've been explaining in the previous sessions, um, there is what is known as an outer protocol towards a guru and an inner protocol towards a guru. So the outer protocol of guru devotion is embodied within thing, within texts such as the 50 verses of guru devotion, which is something that I've been talking about on Tuesday, on my Tuesday sessions of Easy Dharma for the New Normal, which we go into depth in the 50 verses. And in fact, uh, last week's session actually covered a couple of these verses because they are included in Gurus for Hire. And the inner protocol or the inner Guru devotion is actually explained in much more detail, in much more depth in the, um, in the Lam Rim. Okay, so that is also something that we'll probably be covering. In the future, what will happen is um, perhaps from next week onwards, uh, there will only be one Easy Dharma for the New Normal session on the Kachara Facebook page and that will be led by Pastor David, in which he'll be finishing off the, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons. So in those sessions, I do have um, some verses left to explain of the 50 verses of Guru Devotion. So what I will do is once I finish going over Gurus for Hire with all of you, I will um, explain and share with you more about the remaining verses of the, of the 50 verses of Guru Devotion. So let's see who else has joined. Um, Gillian is online. Martin is also online. Good morning to all of you and thank you for joining. So I'm going to go straight into today's um, session. And today's session actually begins on page 66. Now I appreciate the fact that not all of you who are watching today will have a copy of Gurus for Hire. So I will be reading out um, the sections on the book and then we'll stop periodically to explain things or give my 
to share certain things, to share my experiences, and we can go from there. And hopefully it is another productive session today. So the section that we're going to be um, starting off with today is called the inner qualities of a Dharma student, practicing guru devotion with the nine attitudes. We are always talking about the qualities of a guru, what the guru should be, how the guru can be criticized, helped or not helped. The guru is always in the spotlight and there are always a lot of criticism and comments about the guru. And this is something that we've gone into detail in the previous five sessions. We must also consider the qualities of a student. A real student is not necessarily a student of a Rinpoche, a Geshe or a Guru. A student is someone who happens to be learning Dharma from that person. A real student is a student of his or her own mind, of the Dharma. A real student should follow the 50 verses on Guru devotion which are 50 verses that explain outer protocol. This outer protocol is to train the inner mind in awareness and in the service of the Dharma. Spiritual practice and our Guru to make it easier for our Guru to give us the Dharma teachings. For those who cannot serve the Guru well, who are not aware and who are always making mistakes, it is very important for them to read, study and memorize the 50 verses on Guru devotion. It is not to be a slave to the Guru. Every part of that text is for us to develop awareness. In fact, most of it is common sense. Then if we condense those 50 verses, we have the nine attitudes of Guru devotion that as students we should have in receiving Dharma from our teacher and for our spiritual practice to advance. So as Rim Rinpoche explains here, the 50 verses are quite all-encompassing. And as I've been explaining on the Tuesday sessions, the 50 verses are on kind of a gross level. It is all about our conduct. It is the way we behave towards our Guru. It is the way we act. It is what we do with our body. But on a deeper level, you can actually see that it encompasses various aspects of the Dharma path. For example, we talked about making offerings to the Guru, which is actually a method to um, increase our energy of generosity, okay? which is a major part of the Buddhist path. Another one is to curb our anger. So in doing that, by practicing Guru devotion, it makes it easier for us to do that with everyone else. And another one would also be to lessen our ego, to put ourselves down and to submit, submit to the Guru. Submitting here doesn't actually mean becoming a slave to the Guru. Submitting means to understand the Guru's advice or the instructions or even just the general Dharma teachings that the Guru gives and submit to them in a sense that you practice them. And in doing that, you lessen your ego. So I'll continue with the book. Practicing Guru Devotion with the Nine Attitudes. Seeing that the root of all that it is auspicious and good in this life and all my future lifetimes is to enthusiastically devote myself correctly in thought and deed to my spiritual guide who rules the path, never giving him up even for the sake of my life. I shall delight him with the supreme offering of practicing in accordance with his instructions. Number one, with an attitude like a good son, who does not enter into activities independently, but checks his father's demeanor first, and then, sensitive to that, acts in accordance with his father's instructions. If we accept a person as a teacher, we are submitting to our own mind and the Dharma practices to improve our mind, to bring us further and faster in our spiritual evolution. Having a teacher who can give us living experience, talk, answer questions, 
and who has the empowerment, lineage, blessings and oral transmissions to pass on to us is something very, very rare and very precious. In order to receive these teachings, our relationship with our Guru should not be that of a boss to someone subservient, or that of an employer to an employee, or that of an older brother scolding a younger brother. It should not be that of a husband or a wife, in the way that they sometimes fight and sometimes have harmony. It should be like that of an obedient son acting exactly in accordance with the Guru's wishes. If we meet an abusive, scary, ill-motivated Guru, we could, of course, be taken advantage of. This is definitely so, and it has happened in the past to people. But if we have examined our Dharma teacher over time to avoid this problem, we should have no problem being as obedient as we can like a son. What does it mean for us to have obedience to our Guru like a son? It means that if our Guru is a real Guru, he will not give us work that we cannot do. He will not exploit us. He will not use us. He will not harm us in any way, shape or form. If we meet a good Guru and we are obedient like a son, he will give us only exercises, activities and practices that will make us excel. We have to cooperate with our teacher to excel. So that was literally the first verse of the Nine Attitudes. And here you can see it has already brought up a lot of the, of the, um, of the things that we have been talking about over the previous couple of sessions. One of the main here is to actually to check the qualities of your Guru before making a Guru-Disciple relationship. And this is very important. And there's many ways that you can do this. You can do this by seeing if the Guru's teachings um, coincide with general Dharma teachings on compassion, on kindness, on wisdom, and also through the Guru's activities. What, what does the Guru do? How does the Guru teach people? How does the Guru spread or preserve the Dharma? And the, the physical activities of the Guru, what has the Guru led to? Has there been, um, have they made or built or maintained an environment where people can go to to uh, alleviate their suffering? For example, Kachara Forest Retreat is an example of what Samrambuji has done. And here we have a temple, we have offices. The, the entire Kachara organization is run from Kefa. And how did, did Samrambuji preserve and spread the Dharma? It's, it's very simple, samrambuji.com. All of Rinpoche's, many of Rinpoche's works are all online and in Rinpoche's effort to spread and preserve the Dharma. So everything on samrimuchi.com is based on the Dharma and Dharma practice and Rinpoche's wish to preserve that so anybody anywhere in the world can access it just at the click of a button. Remember, if anybody has any questions, you can ask them on the comment section and I will answer them today. So we get to verse 2. With an attitude like a Vajra, indestructibly such that no Mara, harmful companion or anything at all could ever separate you from the Guru. Who are these harmful companions? They are inner and outer Maras. A Mara is an obstacle or a demon but a demon is not always on the outside. In general, Maras represent spirits or ghosts, or people on the outside that may come and say negative things to us about the Dharma or the Guru and push us off the path. Or they could be inner Maras, a lot of anger, impatience, ineptness, laziness and irresponsibility. Those are very, very big Maras. Those inner Maras, laziness, selfishness, anger, stop us from carrying out the Guru's spiritual instructions to us. They are very dangerous. After we have checked out our Guru and accepted him as our Guru, we should see them as Maras and avert them whenever they come to our minds. Now, I just want to stop there. 
when we're talking about the Guru's instructions, a lot of us, and maybe even some of you online at the moment, are probably thinking, I never received an instruction from my Guru. Um, in the case of Samarabhaji, I never received an instruction, so I don't have any instructions. Actually, if you consider Samarabhaji to be your Guru, there are many, many instructions for you to do. Um, and th these are embodied in his Dharma videos, they are embodied in his articles, they are embodied in his talks. Every single thing that Rinpoche said is an instruction to you if you consider him to be a student. For example, there can be articles or videos in which Rinpoche asks you to develop compassion, to be more compassionate towards other people. And maybe that, that compassion can be through work, that compassion could be easier for us to do in, in family environments. But this is something that we should actually strive to do because it is an instruction. Apart from that, Rinpoche would have also given instructions that everybody who considers himself or herself to be one of Rinpoche's students should do something like a sadhana every day. So here in Kachara, our daily sadhana is called the Diamond Path, which focuses on the practices of Lama Tsongkhapa and Dorje Shukden. So that, having a daily sadhana, um, is an instruction from Rinpoche. Even if you didn't receive that instruction directly from Rinpoche, if you class yourself as a student, you do have a student, um, a teacher disciple relationship with a guru. Hence, you should be following what the guru has advised or instructed, whether it is in a video, whether it is in a Dharma article, whether it is in a Dharma book. These are all instructions that Rinpoche has, has given us. Obviously, there may be some people who have received direct instructions to do specific things to help them along their spiritual path. But even if you haven't, there are instructions that do apply to you if you do consider Samarimachi to be your guru. And in doing so, already have a teacher-disciple relationship. Okay, so I'll continue. If they are outer maras, we should push them away and, most, and the most effective way for this is meditating on bodhicitta or great compassion. If they are inner maras, we let the anger, jealousy or lack of faith come and go, come and go, let it go. We should not get attached or be attracted to it. We cannot get rid of anger overnight and if we, take, and if we let it take over us, it can take us away from the spiritual practice. Then there are harmful companions. Harmful companions are not people who come with daggers, clubs and hammers. They are not beings with fangs, red faces, long hair, long fingernails, disheveled and bloody. A harmful companion is anyone who takes our time and energy away from thoughts of enlightenment or thoughts of spiritual progress. The people who overtly and directly criticize their guru are harmful companions. If we hang out with them, we face the danger of losing our confidence and faith and not progressing in our positive spiritual practice. Harmful companions are people who make us turn against or away from or lose confidence in our Guru. They could do it on purpose or accidentally. They could also inadvertently make us lose confidence through their own practice or example. Inadvertently, which is not accidental, means that they break their commitments and their vows, avoid and dislike or do not praise the Guru. We have positive and negative dispositions in our mind. These dispositions will not open according to the environment, sorry, these dispositions will open according to the environment and causes or environmental triggers around us. If we are going around Dharma students or people with the same intentions and the same goals and they encourage us, it triggers the positive dispositions to open. 
if we are going round people who have broken their samaya, even if they are not against our guru, but against their own guru, they have broken samaya energy, which is very dirty. When they come around us, they will affect us. Their energy will bring us down. They're coming around us, talking negatively about their own guru or our guru, or not encouraging us towards our guru in any way, triggers negative dispositions in our own mind to open. A new student needs a kicker upper to encourage them and their practice. They need someone to talk to about the Guru's good qualities, past good actions and what has been done. When we meet someone who does not encourage our relationship with our Guru, who has had a fallout with their Guru or broken their own commitments, they e then even if they do not say one word about the Guru, positive or negative, simply being around these people brings us down immediately. Their objective is already different from ours. Over time, they will wear us down and make us lose confidence. They will make us see flaws in our Guru. We might think that they cannot make us see flaws that we have not already seen, but they can lie and they can manipulate. When Maras or harmful companions try to split us from the Guru, they sometimes talk very nicely. They sometimes sound negative or they sometimes make us feel sorry for them. When, these peop when, we, when those people associated with weak-minded people or with people with lower merits, they will split from their Guru. They will begin to see the Guru less often, avoid the Guru or think negative things about the Guru. What benefit can a person obtain when, influenced by a harmful companion, he starts thinking negative things about his Guru? The harmful companion destroys his own chances for Dharma, and he destroys his other people's chances for Dharma. If they have broken off with their Guru, but we met them through our Guru, or through our Guru's center or friends, why do they still hang around us? If their life is so empty without Dharma friends, Sorry, is their life so empty without Dharma friends? If they have no other friends from outside, what does that tell us about them? There are also the friends who like our Guru, our practice, and they follow our tradition. But they do not practice, they break their commitments, they are lazy, and they do not do their sadhanas or serve their Gurus. They do not hate the Gurus, they like the Gurus, or they might flip back and forth. They might say, my Guru is my Guru one day, and then say, he's my friend another day. They are confused about what they are doing in their own lives, lazy, flippant, and very irresponsible. Those are harmful companions too. To say they are harmful does not mean they are implicitly harmful. It could also be a distracting kind of harm. They are not harmful by nature. They are harmful by action because when we hang around them, they distract our time away from spiritual practice. They may ask us out to a movie every night, not because they want to hurt us or take us away from our practice, but because their own minds are untamed, uncontrolled and unable to allow any type of Dharma to go in. These people are not harmful by character, but are extremely irresponsible and set a very bad example for new students because the new students will not know what to do. To be devotional? To follow or not to follow? So I've seen some more people come on. Um, Kinho is online. Good to see you this morning. Um, Kawai Suki Wong is also online. Dr. Hank is also online. Jerry Go is back online. Thank you everyone for joining. So um, that was a, a section, a little section that was describing what harmful companions are. And I, I got this question asked to me literally a couple of days ago. Why does it say in the text that we should keep away from harmful companions? And the answer is, when we have a guru, if you're, talking, if you're talking about it from terms of your own enlightenment or your own spiritual practice, it is said within the Buddhist text, it actually takes 
three countless aeons to achieve enlightenment, following the normal sutra path. But as Tibetan Buddhists, we practice what is known as the Vajrayana path, which is also known as the diamond path. And following this, it is actually, you're actually able to achieve enlightenment within one lifetime. In fact, enlightenment, if you have all the prerequisites in place, enlightenment can actually be achieved in three years, three months, and three days. Also known as a great retreat that a lot of people do, especially Tibetan Buddhists, or everybody aspires to do a great retreat. Okay? But in order to achieve enlightenment within just three years, compared to three countless aeons, you need to do a lot of groundwork. And this groundwork actually involves doing a lot, okay? It in involves taming your behavior, making your behavior more positive, more virtuous, and also taming your mind. Now, the quickest way to do this, to prepare yourself to receive tantric initiation and then practice tantra, is actually by following Guru devotion. Now, as we've seen, there are aspects of Guru devotion that I mentioned earlier that actually cover the, the path of Dharma. It is about your physical actions. It's about taking control of what you do with your body and making sure that you don't do negative things with your body and doing virtuous things with your body instead. It is also about your speech, how you speak to your guru trains you how to speak to other people, trains you not to scold other people, tells you, trains you how to speak nicely, speak encouraging words to other people. And then lastly, mentally. You train yourself mentally to reduce the various negative qualities that you have in you, whether it is laziness, whether it is anger, whether it is jealousy, whether it is a lack of generosity, whether it is a lack of patience, Guru devotion actually trains you in all of this. And then when you have a firm grasp of Guru devotion, then, as it says in the 50 verses, then you become a proper vessel to receive tantric practice. And through tantric practice, you can achieve enlightenment within one lifetime. But some people have the mistaken view that Guru devotion is only about preparing for tantra. Once you have tantra, you can do whatever you like. Actually, that's not the case. Within tantric practice, guru devotion actually becomes even stronger. The main practice of uh, tantric practice involves meditation upon the guru. Hence, if you have not built up that using your body, your speech and your mind before you receive tantric initiation, it is going to be very, very hard for you to become um, to be able to practice Tantra properly so that you can transform your mind fully to become enlightened. That's why it is said that if you follow the, guru, the path of Guru devotion, you can achieve enlightenment within one lifetime. Because Guru devotion itself, when you have a firm basis and grounding in it, leads you to be able to practice Tantra properly, which will lead you to enlightenment. So that's just one thing I wanted to bring up and share with all of you, which I think is very important to know um, about Guru Devotion. Any questions so far? If you do have any questions, please do ask. The next section is um, about staying away from harmful companions. So Rinpoche explained just previously as I read out what a harmful companion is. So now Rinpoche moves on to the actual point of staying away from a harmful companion and the reasons why. Most of us have more negative dispositions than positive, otherwise we would not be in samsara. When the negative dispositions from our previous lives open, we cannot do dharma practice. In the tantric vows, we are not even allowed to talk to those who, scour who scourge, scorn and dislike our guru. We are not allowed to share food with them, 
share our instruments or our vajras and bells, or talk about tantric secrets or tantric practice them, tantric practice with them anymore. We cannot perform certain prayers or rituals with them anymore because the energy can pollute us, bring us down and trigger the opening of negative energy, negative karma. You might be thinking that Buddha is not very compassionate. Of course he is compassionate. If at this level we allow someone to disturb our practice, how will we become a Buddha to help them? By avoiding them we are being compassionate. We send the message to them that we are not happy with what they are doing and unless they reform, we cannot support them and their actions. On a spiritual level, if someone disturbs our practice and pushes us off, how will we become an attained being or a Buddha to benefit them? At our level, these people's disturbance and broken samaya can push us off the path, influence us and make us think negatively. There might even be other disciples of the teacher that these people always say negative things to and push away from the Guru. When these people push disciples away from the Guru, who suffers? The teacher or these people who push others away? Of course, it is these people who suffer. Staying around, associating, communicating with or being close to people who have broken their Samaya against their teachers or our teacher is very dangerous if we do not know how to handle them. We have to be advanced to handle them. After all, if our teacher cannot tame them and control them, how can we? If we allow them to continue their negative talk or actions, we are not being very compassionate. If we think we can handle them and turn them around, we would have been able to turn them around by now. If we allow them to continue their little games, they will go on for years and years and years. They do not have merits to dig themselves out and we would eventually be helping them to create even heavier negative karma for themselves. They present a danger to us and to themselves and that is why this text specifically tells us to avoid harmful companions who might try to split us from our teachers. So that was verse number two. So I'm going to go into verse number three. With an attitude like the earth that carries all burdens without ever becoming tired. The Guru may give us, very, may give us a very small assignment or work designed to help us, push us to become better and better. Not better in our view, but better in terms of Dharma for our future lives. The Guru might make us do something that is very difficult, but, it is, that what we, but is that what we are concerned about? We have checked out the Guru and sworn our refuge with the Guru. Then after the big refuge ceremony and the big offerings, the feelings, the pictures, the lights, candles, incense and effort, when the Guru asks us to please cut your hair to about two inches short, we reply that we cannot and give 25 reasons why not. Here Rinpoche is actually referring to the, um, the vow that uh, monastics have, which is that um, they can't actually grow their hair more than two, um, actually it's two finger widths, but it's about uh, an inch and a half to two inches. And even if just Rinpoche asks you to cut your hair, um, even if he, I mean, Rinpoche might not want to see, you know, he doesn't really want you just to have short hair. He doesn't, he doesn't want people walking around having short hair. Um, if you're not a monastic, but sometimes the, the Guru will actually try to check your mind and to check where you are by asking you to do things like cut your hair. And some people have a very, very negative reaction to their hair, which actually goes to show that they are very um, attached to the way they look. But if you think about it, your hair will grow back anyway. So even if you do cut it, your hair's gonna grow back. But then people can still argue with the Guru or give him all the sorts of reasons why they cannot. This is just an example that Rinpoche was giving. What happened to the whole ceremony, the vows, the allegiance? What happened to Guru devotion? Do we follow the Guru only when it is convenient for us? 
Does the practice of Guru devotion only apply during a certain time of the month when we do not have friends, when, we, when things are going well for us or when we are not angry? The whole point of the Guru giving us work, no matter how difficult it is, and us actually doing it is to break through our ego. When the Guru helps us break through our ego, then when he gives us a higher level practice, such as practices for controlling our death, we will be able to achieve everything that is included within that practice. But if we cannot even control our devotion to our Guru, how are we going to control something much higher? If we find it so diff difficult to controlling if we find it so difficult to control our speech, our body, and the minor assignments that the Guru asks us to do, how will we be able to do those practices that require us to be free of the ego, to have bodhicitta, and to practice the six paramitas? Again, the question comes up here, what if I don't have an instruction from Guru to do a certain thing? It's very simple. Are you actually practicing what the Guru has taught in his teachings? Are you being a more compassionate person every single day? Are you being a more wise person every single day? If the answer is no, then you're not fulfilling this section of Guru devotion. You should actually strive every day to become a better person. Okay? In fact, I'll give you an example of what to do. In the Lam Rim, it gives an example. There was one Geshe and he had a pile of black stones and he had a pile of white stones and at the end of every day he would analyze what he'd done throughout the day for every negative thing that he did he would put a black stone and for every virtuous thing he did or dharma, part of dharma practice which can be anything that embodies any of the teachings be more compassionate to others helping others anything or doing your sadhana then he'd pick up a white stone and put it then at the end of every day after he's analyzed his actions throughout the day he would see have I today have I done more negative things or have I done more positive things and he found when he started that his pile of black stones representing the negative deeds throughout the day was larger than the positive deeds so then he made a concerted effort every day to actually practice something more positive. So every day he increased slowly but surely, he increased, increased, increased the amount of virtuous things he did and he refrained from doing negative things. And over time, eventually both piles became equal. Then as he continued doing this and implementing what, he, what the Guru had advised him to do, the Guru's teachings on things like compassion, on things like kindness, he found that the pile of white stones had got bigger and bigger and the pile of black stones had got smaller and smaller. So how do we do this? Well, it's very simple. We don't need, we don't need to have um, a pile of white stones and a pile of black stones. But what you can do is you can keep a journal. And at the end of every day, you can write out the negative, analyze what you did in the day and write out the negative things that you did. And on the other side, write out the positive things that you did. And you'll be surprised how many negative things you actually do in a day and how we are not actually following Guru devotion. We are not actually following um, our teacher's instructions to become a better person. And then over time, when you keep this journal, you can actually see that your, um, if you make an effort in it, you will actually see that your virtuous activities or your meritorious activities actually increase over time. Now, this sounds really weird to do. This isn't something that I've made up. This is um, an advice. The Rinpoche told me that story once from the Lam Rim, and then he told me that a modern way to do it would literally to be to keep a journal. And it might seem strange in Buddhist practice, but a lot of people who are very successful in whatever they want to do in life actually have journaling practices. They do journaling practices. You see all of these kind of like self-help 
courses, these self-help speakers and everybody, they always tell you to actually um, list down what you have done in the day and then analyze what you have done in the day. And through that, you can improve yourself in whichever way you want to go, whether it is a secular way or whether it is a spiritual way. The methods are the same, but the motivation behind it is different. So this is something that we can all do. And I think I would suggest that if the people watching this haven't done it so far, just give it, you know, tell yourself you're going to try it for two weeks. And build up the motivation and then just do it. It's very, it's very, very simple. It won't take you that long, but the effects it has on your mind will actually be very, very beneficial. So that's just um, one tip that I wanted to give all of you. So we'll continue with the section. A real guru who is compassionate and cares will be very careful to give us assignments and work. The Guru thinks very carefully. He considers our aptitude, who we are, what we can and cannot do. He then gives us all types of work, duties and jobs to develop the six paramitas such that we can purify our karma and break our ego, our level of perception and our wrong perception of reality. This is for us to reach the next level. Then when he confers higher practices on us, we will get results. The Guru might also give us jobs or assignment to help us avoid something negative that might happen later on. If we do not believe it and we go against it, we will suffer the result. The Guru will not be happy and, will, and he will keep trying to find other ways to lessen what will happen to us later. If we do what he says the first time, the bad effects may be lessened 100%. However, even if the Guru cannot help us avoid the bad incident fully, he would still try to lessen the result for us by 10%. Our Guru might tell us to work in the center once a month. We say we cannot, but at the same time, we ask for initiations, retreats, 10 million mantras, and we can actually do these retreats and mantras. There is no difference. Why are we able to do 10 million mantras, but unable to work once a month in the center? If we do not cooperate, why do we need a guru or a teacher? A guru or teacher is someone who is supposed to be compassionate and kind and is out to help, to serve and help us. When we always reject everything the guru tells us, we have excuses, we are late for everything we are assigned and we never finish anything we are given. That reflects on us and our practice. Yes, the guru is a human being who will be disappointed feel sad and angry and shout at us or tell us off, but the ultimate person who is disappointed is ourselves. The Guru will have even more and greater wisdom than our own mothers and fathers to set us on the right path. The whole point of having a Guru is that the Guru is supposed to have more wisdom to see our past weaknesses, to see our gifts, understand our karma and what is happening to us so he can give us specific practices both meditative and active to help us overcome our personal problems, difficulties and sufferings. However, when assignments are given, are given and out of habit we immediately, say, we immediately say, no, I can't do it. I don't think I can do it. It is very bad. It is precisely because we think we cannot do it that we are given that assignment. The Guru can see something more. Remember last week I was talking about the assignment of uh, Rinpoche asking me to get that lasa the vegetarian lasagna from the, the, the cafe that had stopped making the vegetarian lasagna and no longer made it. It was no longer on their menu. So when, I, when Rinpoche asked me to get it a couple of times, I thought like there's no way I can get it. So then I went to the cafe and asked them to, if they could make it and they said it's not on our menu. We don't even have the ingredients anymore. And so you know, to me, I thought that it was an impossible assignment because here was Rinpoche asking me to get something, but there was, to me, it seemed that there was no way to, to, to get it. But then I kind of thought about it and I asked them if they can cook, if I can get them the ingredients, if they could cook it. And eventually they agreed. So once they had agreed, I went out and got all the ingredients and then came back and then 
lo and behold, they did cook it and I was able to bring the lasagna for Rimchi. And guess what? Rinpoche didn't even eat the lasagna. Rinpoche gave it to everybody else who was working in the writer's office that day. So this assignment from Rinpoche wasn't... Um, originally, I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it. But what Rinpoche was teaching me here is to persevere in, in doing something. And it, it's not like I was doing something bad or evil. I was actually helping to feed, feed people, to give them sustenance. Okay? Originally, I thought it was going to be for Rinpoche wanted to eat it. So it was more of I was, you know, helping Rinpoche to, to sustain himself by eating. So it was a lesson in perseverance, in doing something that is, in this case, it was extremely, you know, it can seem to be extremely non-spiritual because it's just eating a nice meal. But if you think about it, if you can persevere in things like that, it can also teach you how to, you can apply that same perseverance into your spiritual practice. Okay, so I've seen some more people join Annette Chan, Phoebe Young, Sharon Ong. Good morning, uh, Pastor Antoinette. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for joining today's session. So I'll continue with this section. Currently, I'm going over the nine attitudes of Guru, De Guru devotion, and I'm currently on verse three. For example, the Guru might tell us to be generous, to give, and not be miserly. The Guru might tell us to buy silver bowls and to offer them to the Buddha, but we have 101 excuses why we cannot. It is not because we cannot afford the silver bowls, but because we are extremely miserly and have had many lifetimes of habituation. The Guru can see the result of that and he does his best to break it because no one else can. If other people could have, they would have already done so. I have another example to give in, in this. Rinpoche gave a few of us Ladrang staff the assignment. He said it was an assignment. And he said was, it was to get a very, very large statue. Uh, for some people, he gave um, instruction on which statue to get. And other people, he left it up to them. And these people were... and us we were supposed to go out and um, gather the money the funds to actually invite a statue of a holy Buddha so that we could um, we could place it on our altar and we could make offerings every single day so usually we think that this is like on a for, on a spiritual angle in that we can um, I mean it is very spiritual to be able to make offerings to a very beautiful large Buddha image and then to every single day so we can generate merit and to some of us he also said that we also had to get silver offering bowls which Rinpoche is mentioned in the text as well as the as well as the the statue itself so Rinpoche's condition was this the statue has to be at least it was actually at least three foot so Rinpoche um, assigned some of us gave some of us this assignment so at first some of us were very very um, taken aback by this assignment because we didn't know how we were going to do it because such a statue costs a large amount of money but more than that, what went through our minds as soon as we were given the assignment was, why do we need such a big statue? We already have like, um, you know, a one foot statue on, on our altars. We don't need any other statues. Um, it's a lot of money. It's, it's going to be a lot of time um, getting it made and shipping it over from wherever whichever country it comes from and then on top of that we have to get silver offering bowls and um you know we were just kind of some people procrastinated in even starting to um 
get them get get the funds to get starting to get the funds together to do it. And so over time, over a couple of months, Rinpoche realized that we were procrastinating with this assignment. So he told us one day, instead of a three-foot statue, you guys need to get you guys all all need to get a four-foot statue. So then we were thinking, how are we going to do this? Why do we even need a four-foot statue? And we were peop- some of us were procra- okay, some people were procrastinating, and then they still weren't, you know, updating that they had started raising funds for it or you know saving up for it or whatever. And then again, Rinpoche called us all in one day and he asked us about our assignments, how, we, how we're doing with the various assignments that he assigned. And none of us had updated about our assignment of um, getting the statue. So then Rinpoche gave another um, amendment. This time he said, everybody needs to get a five foot statue or bigger. So that was when I had realized that, okay, I better, you know, this is assignment from a guru. It is nothing bad. Having a large, beautiful statue and making offerings every day is nothing bad. In fact, it's good. It's good for us because it generates merit. And with more merit, it's going to be able, it's going to be easier for us to actually practice the Dharma and ultimately transform our minds. So then we got to working on getting um, large statues. And now I think three, three or four of us have very, very large statues that we are now... Uh, making offerings to every single day and that is generating a lot of merit for us and our Dharma practice. The reason I brought this up is because Rimji was talking about the silver bowls and we give 101 excuses of why we cannot do something even if it is within our capability of doing it. We are always trying to get out of something of an assignment of doing some sort of work even with um, general Dharma teachings, apply that, take that example and apply it to general Dharma teachings. Everybody knows that Buddhism is about compassion. Okay? But how many of us are actually practicing compassion in our life, in our daily lives? How many of us have practiced compassion today? Then you could say, oh, I'm compassionate towards my, my, my family, I'm compassionate towards my, you know, you know, my friends and people I like, so I don't need to be compassionate towards everybody else. I've done my fill for the day. And you don't want to spend your time doing something else because, you know, I've got too much to do. I have to go for my kids. I have to go and see my friends. I have to go to the movies. I have to finish my work. I've got a lot of work, I need to finish it. But the thing is that Dharma practice is more than just that. If you do, if you know that you're supposedly practicing compassion in the day and you already say that you're compassionate towards certain people, you don't stop there because that is not the Buddhist thing to do. You actually go one step further. So if you know that you're compassionate towards your family and your friends today, then tomorrow you'll be similarly compassionate to them, but then you need to extend your compassion maybe to people that you're working with. Maybe you um, need to extend your compassion to people that you don't know, such as going to um, a soup kitchen or helping out. Maybe you can be more compassionate to the people that you're already compassionate to and actually help them through anything that they're going through or anything that they're struggling with. So it is the same, it is the same, um, different examples, but it is the same thing. I didn't want to get the statue because I didn't want to do it. And I gave 101 reasons why I, I, I couldn't do it. Even though it, in the end, it turned out that it was within my capability to do Similarly, when it comes to implementing Dharma practice in daily life, be more compassionate, or maybe even just doing your sadhana, you can give yourself 101 excuses why you cannot do it. But the matter of the fact remains, you actually can do it. And if you put the effort into doing it, 
you would be able to do it. Now this is made easier if you think of this as all forms of Guru devotion. Now if you think about your Guru and you have contemplated the qualities of the Guru and you have some sort of faith in your Guru, if you think that being a more compassionate person is actually practicing Guru devotion, which it is, when you think about genera um, generating kindness, compassion, patience, responsibility, generosity, as extensions of Guru devotion, then you will be able to see that you will be able to do it a lot easier than um, if you don't have Guru devotion. Okay, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, please ask on the comment section. All right. Okay. Let me find my place. Okay. A real guru who is compassionate and cares will be very careful to give us assignments and work. The guru thinks very carefully. He considers our aptitude, who we are, what we can and cannot do. He then gives us all types of work, duties and jobs to develop the six parameters such that we can purify our karma and break our ego, our perception and our wrong perception of reality. This is for us to reach the next level. Then when he confers higher practices on us, we will get the results. The Guru might also give us jobs or assignments to help us avoid something negative that might happen later on. If we do not believe it and we go against it, we will suffer the result. The Guru will not be happy and he will keep trying to find other ways to lessen what will happen to us later. If we do what he says the first time, the bad effects may be lessened by 100%. However, even if the Guru cannot help us avoid the bad incident fully, he will still try to lessen the result for us by 10%. Our Guru might tell us to work in the center once a month. We say we cannot do that but at the same time, we can ask for initiations, retreats, 10 million mantras, and we can actually do those retreats and mantras. There is no difference. Oh, I've, okay. For example, the Guru might tell us to be generous, to give and not be miserly. The Guru might tell us to buy silver bowls and to offer them to the Buddha, but we have 101 excuses why we cannot. It is not because we cannot afford the silver bowls, but because we are extremely miserly and have had lifetimes of habituation. The Guru can see the result of that and he does his best to break it because no one else can. If other people could have, they would have already done so. It is like seeing a therapist. First, we check out the reputation of the therapist. We listen and we see some of the results of her clients. When we see that this therapist is wonderful and we hear that she has results, we walk in, pay the fees and we submit, open, surrender and tell her everything, week after week. After a few processes, depending on our problem, we start to find healing. If we resist all the way and do not let go or submit to the therapist, why would we even go to therapy and how would we get the result of therapy? It is the same thing with the Guru. If we resist, fight, we do not do the assignments the Guru gives us and we, covert, and we covertly cover or we try to make things up use sweet words and go round and around. We may have been able to trick our Guru, but we cannot trick ourselves, and we fail our service, our devotion, and ultimately our own spiritual practice. Submitting to the Guru is gaining independence, gaining freedom from our ego, samsara, and ourselves. That is why a real and qualified Guru helps us, that is what a real and qualified Guru helps us to do. When we find such a Guru, we should devote ourselves with folded hands to him. Whatever work he gives us and whatever sufferings there may be, we should, not, we should endure the work he gives us. We have to be accepting. So that was verse number three. So I'm going to continue with verse number four. When carrying out activities on behalf of the Guru, perform them with an attitude like an iron mountain, unmovable, no matter what suffering occurs. If our Guru gives us work, we do it and it creates suffering. It makes us sleepy, 
tired, sick. It drains our pockets. We get financially or emotionally set back. We should accept it without bragging to people that we have done it. Showing off is not Guru devotion and we set a bad example. When we have to endure any type of suffering that the Guru has given us, we should endure it happily. We should do it whether our Guru is watching us or not because by doing so, it does not become difficult or suffering anymore. We have overcome. By enduring our Guru's work and assignments, we will also purify our karma tremendously. The Guru's intent behind giving us the assignment is to overcome something so we can use the skills or qualities gained as a tool to become a Buddha. If we do it, we collect merit because our motivation and intent for doing so is to achieve Buddhahood. The Guru might tell us to run up and down the hill every day to make sure we stay slim and healthy so something does not happen to us. The Guru might know that we will have a heart attack later. We may say it is okay because we are going to die anyway, but we might burden the people around us, or if we die prematurely, we might take a lower rebirth. The Guru may tell us to exercise and lose weight because intention is for us to have a healthy body, for us to discipline ourselves so we can do Dharma practice. If we do make the effort to lose weight, losing weight itself become a collection of merit because of the high intention that goes into achieving it. If our Guru tells us to force and discipline ourselves to stay awake, we may be trying to help, he may be trying to help us avoid something else that may arise due to our sleepiness, a car accident, for example, or something that might hurt someone else. You might wonder, what does this have to do with Dharma? You might think, he didn't tell me to recite or chant anything. He told me to lose weight. That's not Dharma. That's very narrow thinking. All of it is Dharma. Whether a real Guru with compassion and skill, skillful means tells us will be Dharma. If we trust the Guru, we will not see a distinction between simple non-Dharma instructions and higher level Dharma instructions. We will have realized the nature of the Guru and, his nature of, and the nature of his instructions, the nature of our relationship with him and the nature of our submission to him. We will realize that our submission is not to make us lose freedom, it is to help us gain it. Verse 5. When carrying out activities on behalf of the Guru, perform them with an attitude like a worldly servant, who accomplishes everything without hesitation, even if it means taking on all of the worst jobs. We should do our best to fulfill the tasks our Guru gives us. We push ourselves and we get it done. We should be very conscientious about whatever we promise or say to our Guru. This is not a person who just benefits us for something small in this life. If we do what he has told us to do, our work could lead to benefiting many people later and we can collect merit. We can then rejoice. We have done something beautiful. We have gained self-confidence. We can grow. If we are always giving 101 reasons why we cannot do what he has told us to do, we must realize that everyone also has the same reasons. All of us are lazy, want more money, want to take care of our family, want to take care of ourselves and have investments. If we say that we do not want to do Dharma work because we have to work and make money or because we have responsibilities, then we will be doing that for the rest of our lives. We will never ever be free. When do we ever become free of responsibilities? When one responsibility ends, another one starts. You get married, then you have kids which is when another responsibility comes. If your kids do not make it in life, they fall back on you. If they have grandkids, you have extra responsibilities again. It never ends. We all have excuses that we have commitments. When will our commitments ever finish? We are going to be working forever to support ourselves one way or another. Even if we are very rich people, we still have a lot of things to do to maintain our money. We may have to make our family or the people in our company happy, for example. 
If we are not rich, we have to work for an employer throughout our life. If we live off the state or government, or if we have social security, we have to follow their rules and fill out their forms and conventions to get that money. The thing is not to abandon boyfriends, girlfriends, family or parents, no. We should find the middle way, which is to take care of them and do Dharma together. Real Dharma practitioners forsake this life to become a Buddha. But because we are not at that level yet, we find a middle way. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has advised us to split our worldly responsibilities and Dharma practice into a 50-50 percentage. He acknowledges that we definitely cannot practice Dharma 100% of the time, but we can split our time, 50% for our future lives and 50% for this life. I never, forget him, I never forgot him saying that at a teaching in Washington, New Jersey about 25 years ago. I remember thinking it was so practical. As a kid, I had to go to school and do my homework, which took up 50% of my day. And for the other half of the day, I would do my mantras, study, practice, and attend my teacher's talks. We have to make leeway to do Dharma because it is for our own welfare on an ultimate long-term basis. If we always make the excuse that we have children, then by the time we grow up, we might not be able to, d to do Dharma work because we would already be too wrinkled, old, tired or sick. If we are already stuck in that position of having children, family and commitments, then we apply the wisdom someone is telling us now. When we realize that if we put ourselves in that situation, then we work with it. We do it the middle way and split our time equally because our because our we do our sorry we do it the middle way and split our time equally because our because of our commitments and dharma we must realize and remember that we are not doing dharma a favor we are not doing ourselves a favor if we think we are too young now then one day we will think we are too old if we think we are too busy then one day we will not even be capable of doing it. There is no young or old. If we hear the Dharma now, our karma has ripened. Now is the time. Towards the end of this section, is, it's a very, um, there's a point that Rinpoche makes that some of us are very egotistical about the way that we approach Dharma and that we approach going to a Dharma center or we approach relationships with Dharma brothers and sisters. And for some people, it makes them feel good that they go to a Dharma center, they waltz into a Dharma center and they think, wow, I'm here, I'm at this Dharma center. These people at this Dharma center should be very happy that I'm here and they should give me what I want. They should serve me the way I want to be served. They should give me the Dharma that I want to hear. They should give me the assignments or advice to do things that I want to do. And this is a wrong way of thinking about coming to a Dharma center. This is a wrong way of thinking about a relationship with the Dharma brother or sister or even with a guru. Because the Dharma literally doesn't benefit from you. You benefit from the Dharma. So I remember when I, when I always think about this, I always think about a story that Pastor David told. Now, Pastor David was um, he's a long time student of Rinpoche. And when he first met Rinpoche, he met Rinpoche as a friend rather than as a Buddhist teacher. So Pastor David and Rinpoche had a friendship first. And then later on, it um, turned into a teacher-disciple relationship. So there was one point where Rinpoche might have been talking about the Dharma around the vicinity of past where Pastor David was. And at that point, Pastor David was, pra was uh, practicing a different religion. Actually, he wasn't practicing the religion. He was just, he, he had come down from his family. So it was his family religion, his family faith. So he would tell everybody he was of that faith, but he wasn't actually, I don't think, was actually practicing it. 
So he turned to around to Rinpoche and said, um, "Please don't convert me. I don't want to be converted to Buddhism. You know, I don't want to be Buddhist." And um, Rinpoche just turned around to Pastor David and said, "Well, I wouldn't want to convert you anyway because look, if I convert you to Buddhism, what does Buddhism get from you? Nothing." So that kind of shocked Pastor David um, because it was a way of Rinpoche saying that you should um, kind of lessen your ego, especially when it comes to um, Dharma practice, which then Pastor David got interested in. Because for him at that point, um, you know, Rinpoche was trying to tell him, Buddhism doesn't get anything from you being a Buddhist. It's the other way you benefit from being a Buddhist and doing Dharma okay, and practicing the Dharma so I'll carry on with verse 6 I'll see how far we can get maybe we can finish the 9 attitudes today number 6 when carrying out activities on behalf of the Guru perform them with an attitude like a sweeper abandoning pride and feelings of superior, superiority and holding oneself lower than the Guru. When we are with our Guru, the sixth attitude advises us to abandon pride. We explain to and tell our Guru all the reasons why we cannot do what he tells us to do and we make up all kinds of excuses. In front of a Guru, if in front of our Guru we cannot abandon our pride, then why are we studying with him? The whole purpose of having a Guru is to help us cut our pride, which is one of the main causes of taking rebirth in samsara. The Guru is a person who loves and cares for us from compassion and takes care of us. Even if we never give to the Guru, the Guru gives to us. Some students never give the Guru anything, instead they give the Guru arrogance and pride. This does not mean that we should give, just give little gifts. It means that we should really help, take care of the household, clean, wash, supply or sponsor his works. Some people give a lot of material items to the Guru and if we examine what the Guru does with them, we will see he usually uses them to benefit other people. Giving to the Guru is not just giving to the Guru, we actually give to sentient beings. The Guru disseminates our offerings to benefit others so we can collect merit. Number seven. When carrying out activities on the behalf of the Guru, perform them with an attitude like a vehicle that carries out even the most difficult and heaviest work of the Guru joyfully. The minute things get difficult, we give it up and we forget it. Isn't that so typical of us? We have to realize that we will never have this chance again this work is given by someone who has pure intention towards us. There are other people who also have pure intention towards us, but it remains as a worldly intention because they are at that level. Our parents can have pure intention towards us, but it stops at worldly comfort. By being persistent, cons consistent and enthusiastic towards our Guru's work, we fulfill three of the paramitas, giving, joyous effort and patience. In response to whatever the Guru has assigned us, we might give up after a while because we let all our attachments or our laziness take over. Our Guru may tell us that we need to improve. He shouts and he tells us off. Our Gurus will always love us and is always in loving care of us. But the Guru manifests certain ways to tell, tell us about our examples and what we are doing because of, because of our attachment and laziness. For example, in the future, this lack of awareness and lack of care might manifest as an employer telling us to leave and us suffering from financial problems. It might manifest as someone whom we love very much or who benefits us very much saying goodbye because they cannot take our behavior anymore. Number eight. When carrying out activities on behalf of the Guru, perform them with an attitude like a dog, not being upset with the Guru even if the Guru criticizes, belittles or denies you. 
When we have a little pet dog, no matter how we hit it and scream at it, it never bites back. It never fights back. The Guru is not asking us to be a dog. It is not some kind of sex game where we have to get on all fours. The Guru is not asking you to get on, all, on, to get on your hands and knees. This phrase reminds us of how loving and loyal a dog is. No matter how much we hit it, beat it, hurt it, it remains very, very loyal. We should be very loyal and without anger like that towards our Guru. We have to think, is the Guru really provoking us? Is the Guru really angry with us? Is the Guru really mistreating us? If we react in anger, we must first consider whether what he has said to us is justified or not. It will show us the level we are at. If we cannot hold back our own anger and push ourselves towards something better for our own Guru, who compassionately teaches us the path, then who, we can, then who can we hold back our anger for? The whole purpose of the Guru provoking us is to train us to cut down our anger. There is no other reason. The Guru will sometimes deliberately put us in a no-win situation because we may have a big ego. It is a way for him to check on our anger. If our anger is getting less, that means our compassion is growing and if we are getting closer to higher and that we are getting closer to higher practice the guru checks the guru watches number 9 when carrying out activities on behalf of the guru perform them with an attitude like a fairy not getting tired no matter how much one goes back and forth in service of the guru a boat supports passengers it supports people if the guru tells us to stay late we should stay late if the Guru tells us to arrive somewhere early, we should arrive early. We should not go to the Guru and complain that something is too early or too late. That will show us what kind of person we really are. If it was about money or getting Gubli, we would be alert. For that, we would go to a club, dance all night and not get tired. We would be very, very, we would be very friendly with the bartender very nice to the doorman, very courteous with our friends, and very, very nice to the new person we just picked up, no matter how tired we may be. We are able to push us. Why are we able to push ourselves in that situation? We should reflect and think about how nice we were the first time we courted our lovers, how much effort we made, how we sh showed them our best side. We were very nice to them, we were groomed, very sweet, and talked pleasantly. Why are we able to push ourselves for something that brings us only a little bit of pleasure? Husbands, wives, partners, and lovers only bring us pleasure and company for a few years, if it lasts. Why can't we do that for our Guru, for supreme enlightenment, learning how to control our anger and learning the science of transforming our minds? We do not do this for our Guru. Instead, we make him kiss our rear end. When we do not give up, we push ourselves and we keep doing it, we will develop the six paramitas within us, which will be a very great tool when practicing higher teachings to cut away our anger, anger ego and self-grasping. It will be very, very powerful that way. So that actually concludes the, the section on the nine attitudes of Guru devotion and you can see that it went quite in depth on Guru devotion and how we should practice more than how we should practice it's more about the internal processes that we go through and how we should think about it the Guru how we should act with the Guru but even though in this case Rinpoche is talking about uh, physical interactions with a guru. That's actually just one example. It actually covers uh, non-physical interaction with a guru through things like the guru's dharma teachings, through the guru's instructions to do your sadhana every day, to do your um, to to become more compassionate, more kind every single day, and to take it as a process, as a step-by-step uh, -step guide, something that you do and you engage in every single day rather than once a week or once a month. So thank you everybody for joining today's session. 
I will end there. I would just like to thank today's sponsors uh, who are Iman, with the dedication may all suffering quickly cease, all joy and happiness be fulfilled, and the Holy Dharma flourish for everyone. And Chu uh, Suk Fan, may there be peace and happiness and suffering be pacified. Hopefully all of you have learned a little bit more about Guru Devotion from today's session. And thank you very much for joining. Do tune in next week where we'll, I'll be talking about the topic of Samaya and explaining that in a bit more detail. Thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon and do stay tuned for lunch together, which will be up shortly. Thank you.